Recording right now, uh, we're going to pick up here and talk about spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They're made up of motor and sensory axons. So each spinal nerve carries both motor and sensory information. Um, spinal nerves are uh, constructed in a very similar way to muscle. Remember with muscle, we had fascicles, and every fascicle was surrounded by some perineurium. And then every single ner um, muscle cell was surrounded by, uh, I'm sorry, uh, perimysium. And every single muscle cell was surrounded by endomysium. Well, in a nerve, we find that we have every single ner uh, axon is surrounded by endoneurium. Mu uh, nerve fascicles are surrounded by perineurium. And the entire nerve is surrounded by epineurium. <clears throat> And we'll, I think we'll get to the structure of a nerve here pretty soon. But looking at the spinal cord, we see our spinal nerve that emerges out in the intervertebral foramen. And almost as soon as that spinal nerve emerges, it actually branches into two. So it'll branch into a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus, or a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. The dorsal ramus is a branch that goes posteriorly, immediately, and it goes over to the skin and muscle of your back. That's the posterior ramus. So the posterior ramus or dorsal ramus would carry both motor and sensory information. So if you think about sensations from your back or controlling back muscles, that's controlled by the posterior ramus of each spinal nerve. Then we also have a ventral ramus or anterior ramus. And this goes over to your limbs as well as the skin and muscle of your anterior trunk. So all of your limbs receive their nerve fibers from the anterior rami, whether it doesn't matter if it's a posterior or anterior part of a limb. All of your limbs get their uh, information from the anterior ramus here. And then those go out to uh, basically peripheral nerves that we'll talk about. Now, what's interesting, you guys, for the skin across your body, every single patch of skin is served by a specific spinal nerve. So individual spinal nerves serve a very specific patch of skin, which we call a dermatome. And a dermatome, uh, you know, like it's served by a specific spinal nerve, it's a basically a map that follows patterns across your body. So what we see here is on this slide is uh, basically the dermatomal arrangement of spinal nerves across the skin of your body. And you'll notice that it's kind of color-coded and, and striped. Because what this represents, you guys, is that every single region here, striped region, represents the specific spinal nerve that carries information from that specific patch of skin. So what this means is if you know what your dermatomes are and you know that someone has spinal nerve damage in a, a particular nerve, like if they damaged the S3 spinal nerve, then you would understand that they actually would have issues with sensation of the skin in the groin area, right? Or if you know that they actually had damage to their C4 spinal nerve, then they would actually have difficulty with sensation of skin kind of in the you know lower neck region and superior thorax. Now, I don't want you guys to memorize all the dermatomes. just want to know conceptually what a dermatome is. Now, obviously, like your skin's not color-coded like this. And so the way, <laughs> so the, but the way it was mapped out is that, you know, if you, if you, if someone damages a particular nerve ending, then you'll find that they might have anesthesia or lack of sensation like in a specific little patch of skin. They might lose sensation just right here, right? And you know then that that would correlate with a specific spinal nerve, like maybe T2 or something, you know? And um, so it's kind of interesting. And each individual human has this uh, dermatomal pattern. Now, it can vary a little bit from person to person, but for the most part, it follows this, this particular pattern of arrangement. Now, uh, this dermatomal map can be important because anesthesia can occur in a particular region. Uh, wherever there's spinal nerve damage. So if someone damages their sacral spinal nerves, then you're going to see that they're going to lose sensation in the groin and uh, areas of their lower legs. Uh, but it's also involved with referred visceral pain. So referred pain is a type of pain where you feel pain in a dermatome, but the pain is originating in a different part of your body. Because what we find then is that nerve pathways often share a particular pathway. I'll give you guys an example. You know, for the visceral sensory neurons in your guts, they often share the same nerve pathway as the somatic sensory neurons of your skin. But because they converge, your brain can't differentiate between, like, pain of your appendix and pain in the skin of your belly button. Or your, your, you know, your nervous system can't differentiate between pain of your gallbladder or pain in the skin of your right upper shoulder. 
because or your shoulders. Not up and up. There's only one shoulder, right? Up and up shoulder <laughs> doesn't make sense. We don't say. Um, now uh, that's what we call referred pain. So referred pain is where you feel pain in a different area other than the location of that pain. And uh, we'll come back to that in the nerve uh, sensory systems in AMP2. Now, an, often a lot of nerve endings can actually uh, turn into a nerve plexus, and a nerve plexus is a large network of interweaving spinal nerves. And a plexus literally means network or basically net. So a nerve plexus is a large network of this interweaving spinal nerves, and it's all formed by the ventral rami. Every single nerve plexus is only formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves, not the dorsal ramus or posterior ramus, only the ventral rami. And these split into multiple named nerves that we call the terminal branches. So if you guys have ever heard of like a femoral nerve or sciatic nerve or um, ulnar nerve or radial nerve, those come from nerve plexuses, and they're the result of many nerve fibers that intertwine and then kind of become one specific nerve that emerges from that plexus. Okay. Now, these plexuses, uh, there's several of them in the body. We have cervical, brachial, lumbar, sacral plexuses, and you can see them across the spinal cord. Now, but you don't find nerve plexuses, though, in the thoracic region. So the thoracic region of the spinal cord lacks these nerve plexuses, and instead we just call these intercostal nerves. So for the thoracic region, the ventral ramus or anterior ramus of the spinal nerve, it goes anteriorly, and it wraps around between the ribs, and it just goes along the skin of your thorax and the muscles of your thorax. But these nerve fibers don't intertwine. They stay as their own separate nerve. Um, this differs from the nerve plexuses you find in the neck, and the lower back, like the cervical, brachial, lumbar, sacral plexuses, because the nerve endings, or the, the, the nerves that come from your spinal nerves, like the ventral rami, they all intertwine to form a complex plexus there. And so um, the first one we'll talk about then is the cervical plexus. Cervical plexus is formed by cervical spinal nerve C1 through C4. But one of the major nerves that comes from cervical plexus is the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve, with a PH here, originates from C3, C4, C5. In fact, uh, the phrenic nerve is what controls your respiratory diaphragm, like for breathing. So there's a there's like a little catchphrase. They say C3, C4, C5, staying alive. Because if you break your spinal cord below C3, C4, C5, that means your phrenic nerve is still intact and under the control of your brain, which means you can still breathe on your own. If you break your spinal cord above C3, C4, C5, then you might have difficulty breathing because now you're going to lose control over your phrenic nerve which is necessary for ventilation because you've got to contract your respiratory diaphragm in order to breathe. So the phrenic nerve is one of those major nerves that originates here from the cervical plexus. So uh, cervical plexus you can see here. So here is C1, C2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. And uh, you can see that with C1, 2, 3, and 4, the ventral rami start to interweave here. They form a very complex plexus here. There's a lot of nerves that come from cervical plexus. But the major one that we'll talk about here is the phrenic nerve. And so what did phrenic nerve control again? Respiratory. Respiratory diaphragm. You got it. And so that's involved with ventilation or breathing. And so you hear about people who get you know, neck injuries and they, they, have to, they have to go on a ventilator because they can't breathe on their own. Uh, you know, and that would occur if they damage parts of the spinal cord above C3 because then you lose control of your phrenic nerve that emerges from cervical plexus. Uh, there are other nerves that emerge from cervical plexus, you guys. Don't worry about those, though. We just, we just are concerned with the phrenic nerve for this class. Now, the brachial plexus, it emerges from spinal nerve C5 through T1. And the brachial plexus comes out kind of on the lower part of your neck and just inferior or deep to the clavicle. So, in fact, a lot, a lot of the brachial plexus is actually protected by your clavicle. And the brachial plexus goes out to your upper appendage here, kind of in the armpit area, too. And it has nerves that then branch out and control muscles of your arm as well as receive sensation from the skin and joints of your arm. Okay, that's brachial plexus. Now, uh, each brachial plexus nerve uh, basically goes to a particular region of your arm, upper appendage. And uh, what it looks like then, uh, well, actually it's not in the slide yet, but uh, it's going to have these major nerves that emerge from it. We have axillary, median, musculocutaneous, radial, and ulnar nerves. And so on here then, we have C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. You can see that this is all the ventral rami of those spinal nerves coming out 
um, you know, from the spinal column. Those ventral rami combine in a, in a more complex way to form your brachial plexus, which you kind of find just beneath the clavicle here. Uh, in fact, this, would, this over here would actually be the axillary area or armpit. So some of these nerves are actually found in the armpit as well. Now, the brachial plexus has a lot of terminal branches. So we have muscular cutaneous, median, axillary, radial, ulnar. And these nerves go to specific muscles um, in your upper appendage. So, for instance, muscular cutaneous nerve goes to like biceps brachii, brachialis, and corcobrachialis. Um, the median nerve goes to the flexor muscles of your lateral part of your forearm. Okay. Uh, the radial nerve goes to all of the extensors of your upper appendage, like think of your triceps and the extensors of your posterior forearm. The axillary nerve goes to mus muscles like your deltoid and teres minor. And then ulnar nerve, which is over here, it actually goes stays medially down the arm, and it runs right by your elbow in a place called the ulnar sulcus, which is why we call it the funny bone, like your elbow. Because when you bump your elbow, you can bump your ulnar nerve nearby, and um, it can, and ulnar nerve is actually what goes to the medial form flexor muscles, so it's going to be involved with flexion of you know these two fingers here. In fact, that's why there's a hand of benediction here, which is when you when these two fingers are affected, and you get this sort of shape of your hand, you know, if your hand gets stuck in that position, and that's due to, to um, nerve damage, but, and, and typically involves the ulnar nerve, which you can see here, it causes that, that hand of ben benediction, which is interesting. Yeah, it's the right by the ulna. Yeah, uh, Ken. I'm not sure, it doesn't become a plexus until one ring meets up with another, and at that point it becomes a plexus. You got it. So it's not technically a plexus yet until the ventral rami combine together. So technically this is not the nerve plexus yet up here. It's not a nerve plexus until they start combining right around this area, and you get trunks and roots and that kind of stuff. You know, you guys don't need to worry about that. But all of this is the actual brachial plexus right here, okay? The nerve plexus, and they're interconnected. And then over here are the terminal branches, which is our branch. They're they're extensions of the brachial plexus. But technically, muscular cutaneous nerve is not the brachial plexus. It's just a branch of the plexus. What do you guys think is the purpose of this? Why have all this interconnectedness of the nerve fibers? Maybe cover more area. A lot of those structures are needed. Maybe they can work together. In what way, would you think? They're, they're interrelated. A lot of them have to move or work with each other. So you do get mixing of information, right? Yeah. But if you think about this, if what would happen if, if, if you didn't have a brachial plexus and like let's say one of these nerves were cut? Then you would lose all potential output to or input from a limb, right? So by having a brachial plexus, there's actually multiple ways for information to get back to your nervous system or away from your nervous system out to the arm. So it's some redundancy, exactly. So there's some backup plans there for information to get out to muscle. And um, that way it's not just like one road getting, getting to your destination. You know, if that road gets blocked, then you have no way to get to or from that place, right? Um, so it makes sense to have a brachial plexus there and, because then you have uh, multiple ways for information to, to get around a potential blockage. Yeah. Uh, the median nerve goes to the anterior part of your forearm here, and it goes to the lateral part of the anterior forearm. So it's going to go to muscles that control like your, your middle finger, your index finger, and thumb, or basically your first digit, second digit, and third digit. And this, so they're going to control that. Now, uh, this is showing the brachial plexus here, you guys. So we can see the brachial plexus in this region, and then it gives rise to all those peripheral branches. We'll go over this in lab you know, next week. So we'll talk about how the ulnar nerve is right here. You know, we have the median nerve nearby. We have um, our radial nerve back here and our axillary nerve nearby. And, you know, it kind of stays up in the axilla, hence the name axillary nerve. But you can see how these nerves are pretty superficial in the axilla or armpit? Right here. Uh, there's not, they're not protected by bone. The, must, the nerves are very superficial in the armpit, which is why the armpit's a very sensitive region, right? That's why we're ticklish there, you know, because it's very sensitive. There's a lot of nerve endings there. But it's also a place that could potentially get damaged because those nerve fibers are so superficial there. This is one of the reasons why you don't want to wear crutches just right in the armpit. You know, if someone's using crutches long term, uh, you don't want to have their crutch right in the axilla because it can potentially impinge on those nerve and the nerves there and it could lead to long term damage. So, um, you know, or if someone maybe gets injured with their arm outstretched. You hear about people falling with their arm outstretched. Well, it can tear the nerves in their armpit there. It can tear the brachial plexus. 
So they actually might lose sensation and motor control over an entire upper appendage from that injury. It would. Now, in the lumbar plexus, it's formed by spinal nerves L1 to L4. And lumbar plexus um, gives rise to femoral nerve. And the femoral nerve is one of those nerves that actually controls the quadriceps muscles, and it gets information from the skin of your thigh. Okay? So it controls your quadriceps, which are extensors of your leg, and it also gets information from the skin of your anterior thigh. That's femoral nerve. Now, another nerve that, that it's actually emerges from the lumbar plexus is obturator nerve. It's called that because it goes through the obturator foramen, and the obturator nerve goes to the, you're right, the adductors of your thigh. So it goes to the medial part of your thigh, and it goes to your adductor. So if someone had injury to obturator nerve, then they couldn't adduct their thigh, which means they'd have a difficulty, you know, moving their legs closer to the midline. Or basically, like, you know, let's say they, I mean, you definitely couldn't horseback ride, right? Because you couldn't hold on with your thighs. Because that's adduction. If you couldn't do that, then, you know, you could ride a horse or a mechanical bull, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> which is probably a good thing. Yes? So the question was, are there some nerves that repair or are more likely to regenerate more than others? And I, bet, I think a, the best answer to that is it depends on the, the type of injury. It depends on how that nerve was injured, and that will determine whether or not it will grow back very well. You know, And certain injuries will correlate with certain types of nerves. I'm sure there's some epidemiological data out there you know, about maybe if sciatic nerve injuries because of uh, you know, gluteal disruptions are, are maybe heal better than like a femoral nerve injury. Um, I'm not familiar with that sort of data off the top of my head. But, you know, uh, nerves will grow back better if, if the nerves were cut, if those ends are still close together. If the ends end up being farther apart or they're frayed a lot and they get a lot of scar tissue that, that, that forms between the nerve endings, uh, then essentially they won't regrow very well. So the key then is that if the nerve does get cut, you want to have to keep the nerves close together. That way they can then, you know, reconnect, which we talked about in previous chapters. And you also don't want to have a lot of scar tissue that forms between the two because that can also block the way. Um, that's kind of the key thing with, with nerve injury. So the lumbar plexus emerges from L1 to L4. You can see that here. And this is actually the plexus right here, you guys. Now, the, what comes out of the nerve plexus then is femoral nerve as well as your um, obturator nerve. So what did femoral nerve control again? Quadriceps in the skin of your thigh. Good. And then how about obturator nerve? Adductors of your thigh. Very good. And the skin of your medial part of your thigh. Now, if you guys look here, where the nerves emerge from, they actually come out of the posterior abdominal wall, right? Look back here. This is basically where all of your abdominal organs would be. And so the lumbar nerves emerge right where those abdominal organs could be. Now, because they're by abdominal organs, if someone has abdominal growth, like tumors or pregnancy, that can impinge on those lumbar nerves, and that can lead to problems with the lower limbs. So you hear that you know sometimes during pregnancy, because the uterus can grow, grow posteriorly, if it impinges on these lumbar nerves, then you can get things like nerve pain or muscle weakness due to that nerve impingement during pregnancy. Um, otherwise, you know uh, other tumors can also impinge on these lumbar nerves because the, it's near the abdominal organs, and that can also lead to nerve problems. And if you guys have ever heard of uh, sciatica, that happens to relate to the sciatic nerve, and we'll talk about that. But this is actually showing with the lumbar plexus, you guys, up here in the abdominal cavity. And it gives rise to lots of different nerves, but mostly the femoral nerve, which controls your anterior part of your thigh, and obturator nerve, which goes to the medial part of your thigh. So we have the quadriceps and your adductors that are uh, under the control of your lumbar plexus. Now, the sacral plexus emerges from L4 to S4. And uh, sacral plexus is nearby the lumbar plexus. And it gives rise to um, the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve is actually what goes through the greater sciatic notch. It, it actually divides into the tibial division and common fibular division. But the sciatic nerve is a gigantic bundle of axons. This thing is about the width of a thumb. And it, and it comes out right around the gluteal region. Now, uh, the sciatic nerve emerges from lumbar plexus, so L4 to S4. So all of this is lumbar plexus. And where, these, where, these nerve, uh, where the nerves converge right here is actually the sciatic nerve. 
But you guys notice these are color coded. Now this one here is the common fibular division. Over here is the tibial division. But they're all bundled together into one big nerve that we call the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve emerges right from the gluteal area, right here, and it comes out from the greater sciatic notch. And that's a large nerve. I want to say wider than your thumb. And now it's something to keep in mind. The fact that it's somewhat superficial in the gluteal area means that it can be damaged, you know, if someone has injury to the gluteal region. But it's also something to keep in, keep in mind when doing gluteal injections. You know, if you're doing intramuscular injections in the gluteal region, you don't want to get anywhere near this nerve, right? And so, fact, in fact, they kind of teach you about where to identify, you know, a good place to in do injections. It's actually at the juncture of gluteus maximus and medius, which is more, you know, uh, sup it's more superior. And that way you, have, you run no risk of getting the sciatic nerve. If you went too low and did an intramuscular injection uh, lower in the gluteal region, you could potentially get that, hit that sciatic nerve and it can lead to, you know, pain or injury. Um, so you definitely want, want to avoid that. But the sciatic nerve, you guys, because it runs posteriorly on the, the thigh, it's going to control your hamstrings as well as the skin of the posterior thigh. The sciatic nerve, once it gets to the popliteal region behind your knee, also branches into the tibial branch right here and the common fibular division. The tibial division actually controls your, um, your calf muscles here, like the gastrocnemius and soleus, as well as the skin of your calf. The common fibular division controls muscles on the lateral compartment of your, of your leg, like your fibularis longus, as well as muscles in the anterior compartment of your leg, like tibialis anterior or extensor digitorum longus. Um, but those are controlled by the, um, the uh, common fibular division that branches off to the side here. 